I'm alive uh -huh. Feeling good, yeah. alright And you can take yeah. my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me You can take my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me no. I'm free, Come on. I'm alive, I'm alive. Feeling good. Yeah, Thank you very much, this is great to be here Let's pray, Father, in Jesus' name I bless each one here In the name of Jesus, I just declare Satan, you cannot hinder the word going forth and being received. And I bind your power, and I just release the power of the Holy Spirit right now to minister. Revelation, healing, miracles, signs, and wonders, Father, for those that are suffering with aches and pains or diseases in their body. We just agree with you, Holy Spirit. And we release you. And we say, Lord, we receive your healing. We release it. We say, be healed. Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word that does a far greater work even than in our bodies. It changes our hearts for eternity. So we ask you, Father, that each person here might understand who you are and what you do in us and for us through Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, last night I, I kind of indicated where I wanted to go this week. And if you've got a Bible, if you can uh, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I just want to... to this is the nail, okay, that I'm that I'm that I set last night, and we got one good whack on it. We're gonna whack on it, and whack on it, and whack on it until it's just really set in your heart, okay? Second Corinthians chapter five, and I'm gonna uh, read the verse we're really gonna focus on, and then I'm gonna read the context, okay? Verse 17. Therefore. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's really good. Okay? And last night we talked about how God uh, put, created the habitation first and then put the creature in it so that we would have that perfect environment that is going to support and sustain everything that we need. But the spiritual environment that God predestined us to live in, that's going to support and sustain everything we need for our inner man, is that phrase, in Christ. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today, okay? But I want to read some of the context of this so we, so I can draw on it as we, as we go through the day today. And uh, what time am I going to stop? Sweetheart. Um, for this 1040. session. 1040. Or 1030, excuse me. 1030. 1030, okay. Very good, thank you. All right, so I'm going to back up just a little bit. Starting at verse 14. For, if the, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that we who live might no longer might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That sounds pretty good, right? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to have the love of Christ controlling your life? <laughs> Nothing else. I mean, you've been controlled probably by a lot of different things. But it would be really nice to have the love of Christ being the only thing that's going on in here, wouldn't it? Instead of being controlled by fear, being controlled by shame, being controlled by others' manipulation or anger, wouldn't it be really good just to be controlled by the love of Christ? Well, there's some some things that uh, we're going to hit on. That's really what happens. When you live in Christ, Christ lives in you. Amen. Verse 16. Therefore, because all those things are true, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against Him against them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, and we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become 
the righteousness of God in him. That's a good word, okay? All right, now, I want to tell you about one of my heroes. It was kind of a, an incidental thing that we came across. About three, three and a half years ago, our family went through something that was very significant for us. We went through an adoption, and it turned out to be a failed adoption. Very, very uh, difficult emotionally for us. Um, we brought a little three-year-old, or not, we brought a little one-year-old African-American boy into our home, and we were told, man, it's, it's a done deal. You know, we signed the papers, uh, the rest of it's just kind of processing stuff. You know, we have to go through these motions of looking like we're trying to contact the birth father, but we hardly ever find him. 95% of the time we don't. And the 5% of the time that we do, they're all too eager to sign off because they're not ready to take responsibility of financially or emotionally uh, for a child and that kind of thing. So we're, we brought little Zion into our home with high fives from the social workers and, you know, our, our mental, emotional guards were completely <coughs> down. It was like bringing our kid home from the hospital. You know, there's nothing in me or in any of my family saying, you know, there's some risk that we might lose him, so just consider it a foster care situation for a little time. You know, I believed I had a, a new son. And my <coughs> children believed they had a new brother. And... Uh, my wife believed she had a new son. And then about two months down the road, we got a call from, a, from our adoption agency, a real nervous, apologetic phone call of, uh, Mr. Hainer, we, we don't know how to tell you this. We're, we're getting some stuff from courthouses, from the birth father. He's challenging the adoption. And our lawyers have reviewed it, and they think that he's probably got some, some, some ground here. And I was like, what? That's crazy. I mean, that's hard to do. So we went through what was for us like a death of a child. We lost a child together. Um, but what we learned through that experience has been invaluable. One of the things that we did in preparation for adoption, since we were willing to adopt a non-infant child, we had to watch a series of, of DVDs from a lady who became a hero of mine. Her name is Nancy Thompson. I've never met her, and I, um, but she's awesome to me because she lives, at the time that she did this, she was given lectures, and she lived in, in Colorado. And she was part of the social, uh, uh, the, the, the foster care system. But her house was like, you know, a special ops unit, okay? Because these were, this is where they put the kids that were in the foster care system that were just about to end up in juvenile hall or in an insane asylum or something because they were finding it very difficult to place them with any family because the, of the behavior of the child. She said, by the time these children come to live with me, they are torturing pets they've killed usually. Uh, they're finding they are they are not safe to be around anyone that is weaker than them in any way. Uh, and, the, and she explained the the sort of life that a lot of these children had experienced in their in their first and second year in, in a syndrome that uh, psychologists had, had labeled on this. It was called Radical Attachment Disorder, RAD. Um, and it was very interesting because she explained there are some things that we get in place foundationally from just having normal uh, care that, uh, that if you don't get the first couple years, that, that uh, there needs to be some specialized, you know, remediation kind of thing, and that's what she was really, really good at. But I want to explain what she did. So when a baby cries, 
uh, in in a, in kind of a normal family, when a baby cries, you know, people go check out, see what's wrong with the baby, you know, they check the diaper to see if there's a poo poo there or pee pee or you know, or the baby's hungry, we'll try to feed it, we'll pick it up, we'll comfort it. Sometimes they're just inconsolable, and you just kind of like, well, get over it, and you just kind of look at it and do the little thing. But you, you, the what happens is that the baby begins to learn. There's uh, that begins to learn there's other people that will take care of me. And so they begin to have these little foundational wirings to be able to trust other people. In, a, in other homes, babies cry and cry and cry and cry and cry and no one goes to take care of them. Or they cry and cry and cry and somebody goes over and whacks them on the forehead with a shoe and yells at them, shut up! And what they learn from that, what gets reinforced at this real foundational age is I can't trust nobody. There's nobody who cares for me except me. Year two comes along. What happens? They start being able to walk. Right? Right? And if they're in an environment where they're not getting any normal care, any sort of boundaries, any sort of direction, they are just totally left to themselves. And so not only do they learn, I can't trust nobody, it's I don't need to listen to nobody. <laughs> nobody is my boss. Nobody tells me what to do. So all of a sudden, the very... Uh, Miswiring, the worst uh, of the nature of sin, uh, has been completely in, in reinforced uh, in these uh, in, in these uh, children. Uh, and she had this wonderful way of bringing those children into her home and helping them become reestablished. One of the things that she did was really interesting is that she showed a um, an infrared uh, picture of the brain of a three-year-old child that was brought to her. And there's parts of the brain that are activated um, when you are thinking logically, when you are uh, thinking about when you're connecting emotionally, this is kind of a relational part of your brain. This is the logical part of your brain. And in the back, it's kind of that argumentative fight or flight or, you know, that kind of when you're arguing with somebody, the back of your brain is like really big because you're like, you're just trying to look for, you know, what's wrong with their argument and I'm going to be what's right, you know, and, and I'm going to beat you. I'm going to win. And, and this is the way that that's really active. And what was really interesting is this three-year-old, this part of their brain, the whole like front section, was like completely dark. It just was like non-operable. The wiring hadn't been connected there. Um, and the back of the brain was just like on fire. It was just like, man, supernova back here. And so she just asked a question. Can you expect someone who doesn't even have a brain that functions like yours to be able to behave like you do? So part of what she was trying to understand, help people understand is that, they, that these children have been greatly affected by the environment that they were raised in. Now, she then talked about how she went about reestablishing and helping them to grow. And it was really, and part of why I'm doing this because I want you to understand something. When she brought children into her home, she knew that what she was going to do <coughs> was going to transform them on the inside. Okay? She wasn't bringing them into her home hoping that she would finally have somebody to love her. <laughs> you understand that? She did not go into this with her trying to get her emotional needs met. And there's a lot of there's a lot of young ladies that I've met that are that are pregnant because I want a baby so I can finally have somebody who who will love me. That's a bad idea. 
<laughs> that's a bad idea. All right, you're not ready for a baby if that's your mindset. Anyway, she would bring these little children into her, her home, and she said the first thing we did is I just kept them with me. We would make cakes, and we would do it together. And they would learn for the first time, and what they were learning was something really simple. Where mommy's at is where the party is. We get to do, we go horse riding together. We, she had a big farm. Uh, she would uh, talk to them about, you know, she would just involve them in everything that she's doing. They were with her. They were with her. And sometimes they didn't like it necessarily, but they began to, because, they, because it threatened this thing in them that just was constantly reinforced. Nobody loves me. I don't love nobody. I don't need nobody. Nobody needs me. You know, that's what was going on in there. And it was to the nth degree. And that's what gave them that delight in actually <coughs> hurting other things. They had more pleasure in torturing a dog than petting it. I mean, that's kind of how dysfunctional we can get. That's, these are the people that end up like Charles Manson, Marilyn Monroe, Adolf Hitler. These were all people that were raised and they documented that it strongly believed that they all had radical attachment disorder. And they find their ways of, of being God. <laughs> Okay, um, and it's uh, it's ugly. So she, look at what she did. She brought them into the home so that they could be with her. There's something else that she did. She said we had this thing that we called. It was like you. What I tried to establish was this. They need to know that there's someone who's strong enough to lead them but who's compassionate and utterly for them, who will never reject them, right? So what they need is a combination between Grandma and Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So you get Grandma Schwarzenegger, all right? So, you, I mean, you know what Grandma is. I mean, even when you guys were screwing up the worst, you're like, oh, no, come on in and keep it cooking. You know, that's my sweetheart. You're wonderful. I don't know about all that stuff. You're on parole. Oh, is that nice, you know? <laughs> You got Arnold Schwarzenegger he's like, I was brief you, you know. <laughs> so she called it another analogy. She used. She said it's like a steel cage with a velvet lining, but in the cage is a party, a celebration. Outside the cage, it's just not. It, it's it, you can't get outside the cage, basically. Well. Another thing that she would do was this. She said when they got to a point, she would start to have these times that she called snuggle times. All right? So she would, she would sit down on the couch, and she would invite them to come and sit with her and just have that physical contact. And she would try to <laughs> she would spend time looking in their eyes and just saying, I love you. You're so sweet. I like this about you. You know, when we did this, and she'd just look right in their face so that they could begin. And you know what she'd do when they do that? She'd feed them ice cream. And so they're getting, as an older child, what an infant was supposed to get. They're getting this nurture on mommy's breast. And they're getting this... You know, because there's something that happens when you look in the face of your authority and you see delight and you see affection and you experience, oh, this feels so good. You know, I mean, I remember our kids, you know, <laughs> when they would be breastfeeding or whatever, you know, they'd come off the breast, they'd be like, <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and it, it, 
it's just some of the funny looks that they would have and things like that. You don't realize, but wiring is being created. Uh, scientists have documented that there's wiring that takes place in the brain during that experience that doesn't happen in any other situation. But this imitates that and helps wiring actually to be to take place physically in the brain. Um, and sometimes they couldn't even get to the point, like they were not comfortable having anyone love them that way. You know, sometimes you you probably have experienced this. We all experience this to some degree. There's a certain amount of affection you can receive. But then if somebody really be, really comes up to you, like some people have a difficult time accepting a compliment. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. Man, you're awesome. You know? Because it's something like, Ugh, you know, it, you, something wells up in you like, I don't know how, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> you know, uh, what do you want from me? Because it's threatening something inside, like, I don't know if I can live up to that. Uh, or whatever, you know, it comes with expectation. It's come, it feels like a threat to be loved so much. Instead of, wow, you can just receive that. And so sometimes they had to start off, she would just read a book while, while they kind of laid their head on her shoulder. And then after a while, you know, she would you like some ice cream here? Why don't you put your hand yeah. on? So, you know, she's, she had a way of being able to work effectively with these kids. And she said sometimes uh, there would be like, she gave an account, there was a 13-year-old who would walk into the room, you know, kind of walked in a little bit and walked out, walked in a little bit, and, and she's like, they actually want some snow time. And she, would you like to come and get some ice cream? She said, and they're like, me? And she, no. And you're like, it's okay. I'm like, really? Yeah. You know, we make the mistake sometimes, you know, because we're all, we got like these adult bodies. And so we expect people to be completely secure and strong on the inside. And then you don't realize these bodies got older, but they're still like this three-year-old who's really wanting to be loved inside of that person. <laughs> and sometimes that little three-year-old comes out like a little tenor. And I didn't get love, I didn't want to suck her. <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> yeah, they don't want to suck her. They want love, they want affection, they want information. Well, it is interesting. So, as this goes on, they learn some boundaries. But what keeps them in the boundaries is not having all these rules and boundaries. What keeps them in the boundaries is this attachment that's being created of love. Do you understand? They could care less for the rules of the house, even if they're really good. What keeps them in the house is the love that's being established. And the boundaries are simply, uh, you know, this is the way that we keep you in that environment of love. I don't really care about anything. I don't care about the rules so much. I want those are there so that we can establish this love. All right? Well, there would come a point always, she said, when they, they started to experience, they started to feel loving someone and trusting someone and being loved and they liked it and there was a point where it would kind of scare them a little bit, alright? And she said at that point, they would usually pull a big one. They would do something really, really stupid and it was almost defiant and on purpose and they would do it just to prove to themselves, see, they're going to reject me. See, I really can't trust them. See, blah, blah, blah. And it was that, it was the, the golem part of Smeagol, you know? <laughs> if you're familiar with that. Well, she gave this account one time. She came down the stairs of her house. And there was a little five-year-old girl who was in the middle of her living room floor. She had her dress up around her, uh, around her uh, middle up here. And she had just did a big number two right in the middle of the carpet on the living room floor. And uh, Nancy walked down the stairs. And one of the things that she was trying to do was to uh, encourage parents, foster parents, social workers to say, look, 
if if you are if you are getting your happiness and your joy and your peace and your security uh, and your strokes from those kids, if you're looking to them to do that, you're going to react in so many ways because they just everything that they're doing is calculated to uh, to to you know get it you know to get under your skin and to get in your mind and that kind of stuff. You have to be secure. You have to get your joy and your peace and know who you are and get that from God, right? But when you're filled with His peace and your joy, when they do something stupid, it doesn't become your problem. It's their problem. And so don't let what they do that's disobedient, defiant, and stupid get up onto your skin. Let it be their problem. And I was like... Yeah, how does that work? You know, and then she tells a story. So she's coming down the stairs, and you know, you got a five-year-old who just did a dump in the middle of the living room. You know, and I'm thinking, what would I do if I went down the stairs this morning and uh, Phoebe, my my closest to five-year-old, had just did a poo-poo on the floor? I'd probably freak. You know, why? Because I, I didn't have this mindset, especially not when I wake up in the morning, you know. Uh, I, but this was the beginning for me of, of uncovering a whole nother layer of what, what it meant to walk in Christ. To be surrounded by people that you don't want anything from. Who are broken and you're okay with their brokenness. Because you've dealt with the brokenness inside of you. And you've found the wholeness of God filling you. So that you can be in their life, not as someone who demands and needs and expects something from them in order for you to maintain something about yourself, but that you actually got what you need from God and that you are filled already and you're in their life to pour out what you've received. So you know they're broken. You know they're stupid. You know they're, they're, they're defiant. You know that they've got some issues. And you're okay with that. She walks down the stairs. Five-year-old, dump on the floor. Big, defiant grin like, see? Now, you, now you're really going to reject me. You know what happened? Nancy looks at it, walks right through to the kitchen, didn't say a word, walks into the utility room, gets the bucket and the plastic gloves and goes over to the sink, fills it with hot water, pours a little, uh, you know, cleanser and stuff in there, and walks and gets a brush and walks over, sits the bucket down, the gloves and the brush. She says, honey, I don't know why you did that there. It's sure going to take a lot of work. I'm going to go upstairs and read. Uh, I'll be back down in about a half hour and uh, uh, this should be cleaned up. I love you. I love you. And she walked upstairs and read a book for 30 minutes, came back down and it was clean. Now, I want to say that to you because I want you to know that God has brought us into the house. And He has brought us into that environment that we need. But we come into that environment a lot of times with orphan mindsets. Okay? And... He heals us. He really does. And so I want to talk to you about that. He will let you. He makes you responsible for your decisions. If you want to take a dump in the middle of your life, He will let you do it. And He will give you a bucket. <laughs> and He will give you a scrub brush. And He will say, I want you to clean that up. And sometimes those messes take a while to clean up. But that is not God rejecting you. He will not kick you out of the house. If you choose to leave the house, run away forever, you know, there's different theological opinions about that. But I just decided all them verses don't apply to me. <laughs> you know why? Because I ain't running away. I'm in the house forever. And that's good. Because that's where I like to be. I've been outside the house before. That sucks. <laughs> it really isn't good. But I want to talk to you this morning about the way I want that that's really the, oh, and this is the cool thing, that that three-year-old 
After living with Nancy for two years, they did another scan of that three-year-old brain. It was completely normal. Yeah. Completely normal. So what we have here is a physical parable of an invisible reality. Not only does God do that in the natural, but the natural is just following a pattern of the ultimate reality, the spiritual reality that we find in Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 18, He said this to His disciples, right? He said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. See, the Father was in the Son. So the Father was fathering people through the Son. He was fathering the Son. Because even while He's bodily on the earth, His innards are inside the Father. That's the, that's the environment that the Son has always lived in. This is, you're my Son, I'm so well pleased in you. And He never became detached from that. He never started trying to get His identity from out here. He was, he was used to us being idiots. <laughs> he, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he went against us for our issues. The only people he was against were the slave drivers, the Pharisees. See what happens when orphans think they come into the house, but they come into the house as slaves. A, a, a slave mindset is just a, a religious orphan. Do you understand that? We will talk about this. So I want to contrast this morning about living as sons. Because that's really what we need to learn how to do. When, I, when we brought Zion into our home, he was only one year old. And I could tell he already had some old messages playing in his brain. He had a weird relationship with food. He he some he would sometimes like literally strain like he like a weightlifter getting ready to lift a weight to get that last bite of food in. Uh, I, I think that he had times where he suffered from not being able to get food when he wanted to eat. He sometimes blew up emotionally like it didn't have anything to do with anything that we could tell you know and, and that it was just very strange and so. But we knew something. We that if Zion could just see himself through our eyes, he would not be afraid of not eating. He would know I'm in Daddy's house. I, when I get to be able to walk, I can open the refrigerator and get what I want. <laughs> They're never going to let me go hungry. I'm in Daddy's house. I'm not a second-class son. See, I don't. I make a distinction between that which came in from you know, what was working in Zion that he brought in from outside the house and who I truly saw him. I didn't see him as he, as uh, uh, he, he, as a young man with a bunch of dysfunctions. I saw him as a son, and so I was I was working past his dysfunctions. So that he, so that he could um, experience what it was like to be loved as a son. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Same way that when a when a parent has a child who gets sick, right? You want to kill the virus, but not the child, right? So you make a distinction. But if they get cranky because of the virus in them. The parent kind of understands, you know, they're not feeling well today because they've got stuff inside them that doesn't belong to them. God does the same thing spiritually. They've got lies in their hearts and their minds that were planted there by the father of lies, and that's affecting their whole mindset. And so they're in my house now, and they are sons. When we brought Zion into our home, he, I realized I did not have a son love and adopted son love. I just had a son love. And I, what adoption was, was bringing him into that place in my heart. He is all of me. Hey, check this out. How much does the father love the son? 
Oh my goodness. You've been adopted into that place. I want to show you this from the Word of God. Galatians chapter 4. See, a lot of times we have this mindset, a mindset of orphans. You know what? Jesus is looking at... Say, go to stay at Galatians 4, but you know, Jesus is looking at grown men who had run businesses, who, who were family men, some of them, who were uh, established, who he said, come follow me, and they left everything and came follow him, and now he's looking at them, he said, I won't leave you as orphans. I mean, as far as Jesus is concerned, if you don't know God as your father, you are an orphan. You are a spiritual orphan. You're like, you're like those kids in Honduras and Brazil that are running around picking through the dumps. Or washing windshields and trying to beg for money and stuff like that. You, you're, you're thinking only for yourself. Nobody else will take care of me. Right? You're, you're, you're just scheming. You're just thinking about your needs. And everybody else is just a means to that end. And he said, you know what? When you don't have a father, that's the way people live. And the angels of heaven look down at the Donald Trumps of this world or people you know, that are rich and famous who don't have God as their father, and they look at them and say, these orphans, these poor orphans rummaging through the world just trying to get what their father is only going to be able to give them. And Jesus said, it's been really cool. The father was in him. Being able to father finally, you know, we we I, I I long for a day that we might be able to see Zion and give him a hug and say, you don't even know us anymore. We've loved you your entire life, you know. But it's crazy. There's 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 somebody who loves you that much, even more, and he's your father in heaven. And He's able to be with you. So it's good. Through me, He gets to run to you and give you a big hug. You know, through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, He can really be with you. Alright, so, we don't want to live as orphans. The Father doesn't want us living as orphans, so let's don't live as orphans. If we find in ourselves those orphan mindsets rising up, we need, we'll be able to make a distinction as we understand the mindset of a son, be able to step into that walk in there, okay? Alright, so Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. You see, when, but, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law. Okay? Now just a second here. He's, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law so that he might do what? Redeem those who were under the law. You know what this is? This is God paying adoption fees. This is God uh, making sure that what, that what happened to us with Zion could never happen. He's paying to make sure that, that the law and the old man can make no claim on you. When you come into the family, you are sealed by blood. Your blood bought, it's all sealed. You are with Him forever. That's good. Jesus said, I, I and the Father one, I have my sheep in my hand, and no one can snatch them from my hand. Isn't that good? Amen. That's good. I like that. So, that it's important that we are established in that, that we are secure, that we know that, you know what, my Father loves me. He's never going to let anyone take me from Him. That we mean that much to Him. Alright? <clears throat> but, a lot of people get that much of the Gospel, and they think, okay, we just, now what? We're in the house. And, you know, we're saved by grace, and then they start getting a bunch of rules. Well, now you got to change this, fix this, do that, don't do that. And, you know, it sounds like, Whoa, you know, and then it's like, this is, I, I don't, I can't, I don't know how to live that good. I'm not that great, you know. And it feels like a bunch of expectations all of a sudden, right? And then, 
If you're not careful, you begin to feel like God is mainly disappointed with you. God is mainly trying to get you to change so that He could really love you. But that's not the way things are working, okay? Watch this. He sent, uh, verse 5, so that He might redeem those that were under the law, that we might do what? Receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What did God do? He adopted you as a son. He, he paid the redemption price. Why? It's a love thing. In 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we would be called the children of God. Do you understand the reason He makes you a son instead of, you know, great, you're saved from hell. Now, do everything I want. Don't expect to be loved by me. You're just not going to go to hell. But finally, you're going to start doing what you're told. He could have done that if He were a different God. If He were Allah, that's what you get. But He ain't Allah. <laughs> he is Almighty God. And He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God who is love. He's our Father who is in heaven. And so what, is his, what does a father do? He has sons. So he adopts you as sons. You know, this is, this is how it comes down for me. You know, I, I learned like y'all do, you know, read the Bible, pray, try to meditate on the Word, uh, you know, don't do the bad things, do the good things, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was trying, I was doing a you know, fairly good job because I was a fairly disciplined person. But deep down inside, I always knew that there was a bunch of stuff I needed to improve. So every time I went to God, you know, my prayer life basically consisted, God help me have a good day, help, help things not go bad, because I don't like when things don't go bad, and help me not to be a screw-up. <laughs> help me to do this and so it was basically behavior oriented uh, event oriented it was me bringing my life down here, these things out here up to God to hopefully get some sort of blessing and touch on those things is that the way the son and the father have been relating all eternity <laughs> man so I remember one time God saying it to me like this. He said, Andy, I've seen all these things that you've been doing to try to build a relationship with me. How you've been praying diligently and reading your word diligently and trying your best to transform your character and all this kind of stuff. And he said, you know, listen, how about we do this? How about we set all that aside and this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you my son's relationship with me as your relationship for you to enjoy by faith. Mm -hmm. I will give you that very same relationship as a gift. You enjoy that by faith. You step into the love I've got for him. It's yours. It's a gift for you to enjoy forever. Enjoy being loved with a love that you didn't earn. A love that it's just His. And now He, through His death and resurrection, has given you that so that you get to participate in Jesus Christ. See, we, we screw up because we think that the Christian life is imitating Jesus. It's not. It's participating in Jesus. We get to participate in Him. We get to partake of Him. Second Peter, uh, verse one, ch or chapter one, verse four says, "By His precious and magnificent promises, He has made you a partaker of the divine nature." See, it's not like God's over here and we get to see how Jesus lived, and we do our best to become like that with our old nature. It's like, oh, He did. 
He did Jesus stuff because he had Jesus' life inside of him. See, he had the same human life that you and I have, but he had something else. He knew that the human life was a, a container of a spiritual nature. And he had the nature of his Father living inside of him. So what he did was this, is he simply lived by the life of his Father. Christian, the Christian life is not just a matter of lifestyle. It's a different life form. It's a different life form. It is the divine nature of God. You put a flower in a pot, it's going to have a short lifespan, stand really still, grow up, smell good, die. You can talk to it all you want. It will not talk back. Okay? You can love it all you want. It won't love back. You can take an alligator, you can put it in your home, you can call it kitty, 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 and, 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 and scratch behind its ears, but one day it will scratch behind your ears. <laughs> and you are going to look like food did. It will not grow fur. It will not be warm-blooded. It will find a warmest room in the house and it will find something to eat. And it might be you. Why? It's a matter of biology. You can't be in the flower kingdom unless you have flower biology. You can't be in alligator kingdom unless you've got alligator biology. Alligators do alligator stuff because of DNA. Do you understand that? Jesus Christ had a biological advantage that He was bringing into the human race. Human beings, apart from God, have a natural biology. We have a natural design. Right? But it's incomplete because we were designed to participate and to get our energy, to get our, our, our love, to get our joy, to get our truth, to get our fulfillment by being containers of a whole other life form. We are to be two life form beings. We were unique in all of the creation of God. And Jesus was that. He said, look, if you see me, you're not seeing me. You're seeing the life of my Father through me. If you're hearing me, I'm just speaking to you the things I heard from my Father. So He was hearing from His Father. He was manifesting the Father. And He said, I live in Him. He lives in me. But I'm hooking you up so that you can live in me. And all that the Father is in me is downloaded now into you. So he said, look, instead of running the programs on your hard drive, how about you hook up into to me and start live streaming what's on the Father's server? Isn't that good? It's a lot better. Your program's got all kind of viruses. <laughs> but that's what he's done for us. That's what this verse says. Because you are sons, not only does he adopt you and put you in Christ, he puts Christ in you. Mm -hmm. But the way that the life of Christ operates in you is when you take by faith that position of putting on Jesus Christ. I'm going to go a little bit over here if that's okay. And then we'll, we'll still have a 10 minute break and then I'll take it off the second time. If that's okay? All right, good. All right. I want to, you guys know, some of you are probably familiar with the story of, of Jacob, how he got the firstborn blessing. He, it was prophesied he was supposed to get it. But the way he went about doing it was completely illegal. All right, He, he and his mom conspired uh, to <laughs> deceive their father. Father was supposed to just give it to him, but it didn't happen that way. But he did something illegally. Because the father had fallen in love with the firstborn. He liked a manly man. He didn't like this old mama boy. <laughs> All right? He liked a guy to go out and hunt. You know, he was like... A, you know, the, the Duck Dynasty, maybe, you know? He, he liked that guy, you know? And he, he liked, he liked the, the wild, fresh stew. Uh, he liked the, the stink of the outdoors. He liked you know, a man with some hair on his shoulders. Uh, and that's what he saw all the time, you know? He had hair all over him. And so, what if Jacob had a smooth skin, you know? He was like painting pictures. <laughs> He's like, oh my, <laughs> I don't know if I want to give him the firstborn blessing. 
but he's going blind. And he says, I'm going to give you my firstborn blessing. Esau goes out to the field. Jacob and his mom said, bring me two goats. They kill the goats. And mom makes the stew. And then they put all this fur on Jacob. And they get Esau's robe. And they put Esau's robe on him. And they send him in with the dish that Esau would prepare. And, and he walk into the father. And, and he says, here I am, father. And the father says, who or who? And then he says, I'm Esau. You're firstborn. I brought the meal that, uh, for you. And he says, well, sounds like Jacob. He said, no, nope, I'm Esau. And, and he comes up to him and he feels his hands. The hands of Esau. And gives him a hug. The fragrance of Esau. <laughs> feels the neck. The neck of Esau. He said, all right, give me some of that food. Man, satisfies my hunger like Esau. Firstborn smell, firstborn hands, firstborn robe, firstborn neck, firstborn satisfaction, firstborn preparation. You get firstborn blessing. Folks, well, what Jacob did illegally, we get to do legally. We don't go to God in us. We go to God in the firstborn, the Lord Almighty, Jesus Christ. We put the works of His hands on our hands. The works of our hands don't always look real good, but we put Jesus' hands on our hands. What has He done? What He did, He did on your behalf. And so we go to God in that. We go to God in His robe, the robe of His righteousness. I like going to God. Oh God, here I am. I thank You that I get to wear the righteousness of Jesus Christ before You. I thank You that I'm spotless and squeaky clean. <laughs> that I'm holy with the holiness of Jesus. That I'm blameless in all of His blamelessness. That I am new as if I've never sinned because the me that sinned is dead with Jesus. That I am completely righteous, completely blameless, completely holy. And it's not no make believe, because Jesus really lives inside of you. Inside your spirit, Jesus really lives inside of you. Colossians chapter 3 when Christ, who is your life, is revealed. You will be revealed with Him in glory. Do you understand? You're not just called children of God. You're not just loved like the very Son of God from the Father and blessed with like a firstborn Son from the Father. Do you understand? You are as blessed as Jesus. You are as loved as Jesus. You are as righteous as Jesus. You're as holy as Jesus and blameless as Jesus. Why? Because God made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He took all your sin, poured it into Jesus. Why? So that He could take all of His righteousness, the righteousness of His Spirit, the righteousness of His life, put it inside of you and say, that's your life. That's your Christian life. Live by that. So we'll talk about what it's like to live by that life. Because it's a wonderful life of fellowship. Face to face with the Father. Enjoying the Father. Looking at you. Saying, man, I delight in you. Drink some of this. Eat some of this. I mean, that's what fills us up. That's what rewires our brain. So that we're not so psychotic anymore. So that... Because you can't expect... A brain that was formed as an orphan to function like the brain of a loved son. But when you receive the spirit in the mind of a loved son, it functions normally from the get-go. We just need to learn how to press the on button. Right? So that we're operating in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that
that environment, even while we're learning to live by His Spirit, that environment never changes. We're always in the home. He's brought us and He puts us in Christ. And whether we believe it or not, right? Whether we're like the five-year-old girl with a dress up around her middle with a dunk, you know, right behind us. Uh, and, you know, as far as God's concerned, you're my child. And soon you realize that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That I want you and I value you more than you ever know. The more you're going to stop acting this way. But I'm not going to treat you by your behavior. Your behavior doesn't define your worth to me. I define your worth to me. And I say, I love you as a son, as my very own. You can't change that. I don't give you that right. Isn't that good? I'm glad you didn't give me that right. I'm glad he does all right, so Father, in Jesus' name, seal this word in the hearts of your children. Amen. Yeah, I'm alive. Uh -huh. Feeling good. Yeah. All right. And you can take my joy. Because the world no. didn't give it to me. You can take my joy. Because the world no. didn't give it to me.